Okay, so here is the fifth part of the Patterns of, Patterns of Inheritance lecture. Sorry this one's so long, but there's just a lot to go over when we talk about genetics and how to work genetic problems working through these scenarios. So in the last lectures, we've talked about scientists behind the foundations of genetics, some of the basics of genetics with monohybrids, dihybrids, and then we were also talking about how Mendel established those basic rules, but we're discovering there's extensions or exceptions to the rules of Mendel. So not that he didn't do a great job, just we're learning new things. Um, polygenic inheritance was one of the extensions. Make sure you guys are comfortable with what that is. There's trying to be a big hint for you here. Uh, pleiotropic examples. You know, what is that? What happens? How does pleiotropy occur? Those types of things. Uh, an example of another extension is what's called multiple alleles or codominance. And this is one, I'm going to work a problem over this. You guys will need to know how to do these. So definitely go to the other lecture where it talks about genetic problems, how to work them. So with a multiple allele scenario or codominance, there are more than two alleles for a gene within the population. So the only example I want you guys to know for this course is blood typing. Okay? That's it. Blood typing is considered codominance. There are two alleles for that particular gene that determines your blood type. <clears throat> so the challenge is, in the human population, we have blood type A, we have blood type B, we have blood type O, and we have blood type AB. So we have four blood types, not just two, when we talk about dominant and recessive. So it gets into what's called codominance. So A is actually considered a dominant, oh, sorry about that, considered a dominant blood type. If you have the alleles for blood type A, you could be homozygous. <clears throat> you could also be heterozygous for blood type A. So I'm going to show you two ways of representing this. I'm going to let you guys choose which way you want to use. I'm okay with either of them. So one example of blood type A is two dominant A alleles. That means you're going to express the dominant phenotype. You'll have A blood. So we stick your finger, put the little stuff on it, and you have A blood showing up. You could also be heterozygous for A. Big A, but you carry a recessive allele for blood type O. Both of those individuals will show A blood type when their blood is tested. Okay, now we're not worried about positive or negative. We're just simply talking about blood type and expression. All right, so you can use big A, big A, or big A, little O to represent A blood type. So the phenotype is A, B, O, or A, B. The genotype is big A, big A, big A, little O. Now, if you're a B individual, B individuals could have big B, big B. They have dominant alleles, and they express B. They could also be heterozygous and have B, little o. That's going to also be or express as a B blood type individual. All right, so both of those are considered dominant traits, dominant or dominant variations when we talk about blood type. A is dominant to O, B is dominant to O. O is a recessive. The only way O blood type shows up is if the individual has two recessive alleles. Now, where it gets into this codominance scenario is if you take an A and put it together with a B, it expresses as AB blood. That's your codominance. A cannot block B. B cannot block A. They equally express 
and this gives us the AB blood type. Okay, now, depending upon the source you work with, the book, the online source, the instructor, etc., they may say, go ahead and use the letters that you're looking at here for your genotypes. Others will require you to use the letter I to represent the blood type. I, and then it would have a superscript A, and unfortunately I apologize, I can't do superscript in, in uh, PowerPoint <clears throat> with this version. So you would have IA, IA for homozygous. This is your homozygous dominant A person. The other option would be IA little i, oh, let me open this up a little more, there you go, little i to represent the heterozygous individual. So if you see I, big A, again that should be superscript, and a little I, that's the heterozygous, the individual who is a carrier for the little I's. Now two little I's are how we represent O blood, because it's recessive. If you're a B person, the other option is I, should be superscript B, I superscript B, that will represent as a B individual, just like this individual here. <clears throat> but the second individual, this capital I, superscript B, little i, that is the carrier. Both these individuals carry the recessive allele. Now AB, if we're using the other version, you would have capital I, capital A, capital I, capital B, and that is a individual who is an AB blood type. Okay, so again, I'm going to work some of these problems out in a different lecture. I'll use either paint or a stylus and actually draw it out and walk you guys through it, but make sure you can do a problem that involves blood typing or codominance. It is the only type of codominance scenario I want you guys to make sure you're comfortable with is going to be the blood typing. All right, so that's why I put my little red star in there for you. This is an important type of genetic problem to be comfortable with. All right, so it's an exception to Mendel though. Does not fit monohybrid dominant recessive basic relationships. So again, here's our little chart showing the representation of the alleles, there's our superscript A's, there's our superscript B's, recessor, lowercase i represents the recessive allele, two recessives equal the O individual. Okay, and also gives you an idea of who you can donate blood to, who you can receive it to. Okay, so what it is, is it's the genetics here are expressing or producing a particular sugar on the cell membrane. So that's what we want to keep in mind with blood typing. Okay, here is another example of something that just doesn't fit Mendel's rule. It's called incomplete dominance. This is where you have one trait and three variations. Okay, so incomplete dominance, one trait, three variations. So neither of the variations can block the other one. So in our example here, you have a red flower and a white flower. Red does not block white. White doesn't block red. They both can show up. You can show up as red. You can show up as white. But when you blend their genetics, you put them together half and half, you get a third color, pink this intermediate. So incomplete dominance. I'll work one of these problems as well on the, uh, I want to draw it out for you guys as well. So again, another type of problem. Make sure you understand when it is incomplete dominance and when we have incomplete dominance, how do we determine the genetics of the individuals, the phenotypes and the genotypes. Okay. So perfect example, think about somebody with straight hair 
somebody with curly hair, they have children, they tend to have wavy hair. Wavy hair is the intermediate or the blending of these two variations. All right, so definitely another problem to make sure you guys can work. Okay, so as we continue to look at genetics, what we're realizing is that the environment plays a big role in this. It's what we call phenotypic plasticity. The environment can influence the expression of a given trait. Sometimes it's color. Sometimes you, know, you look at the, the suntan on the feet here. The, it's tan lines from all those people with sandals. That's the environment. The environment determines how dark your skin gets. Well, I shouldn't say it determines it. It works with the genetics to express that particular trait. So the cat that we're looking at, this little Siamese cat, and this also works with Himalayan rabbits and a variety of other species, temperature dictates the color of their fur. So when the cat, the cells in the cat's body are going through the cell cycle, spinning through that cycle, and they're creating hair cells, if those cells are at a higher temperature, higher body temperature, they do not produce pigment. The tyrosinase is inactive and there's no pigment produced here, so you get white hair. But if those cells are actually cooled down below 33 degrees Celsius, that's the threshold, <clears throat> then the pigment becomes dark. So tyrosinase becomes active, creating a dark pigment. So your tail, your ears, the nose, sometimes the paws are darker because of the temperature influencing what gene gets turned on, what gene gets turned off, how the gene expresses. So in us, we all have pigmentation in our skin, little things called melanocytes. These are little pigment factories. Those things will produce more pigment if they're exposed to sun, and that's what gives us a tan. We take them away from the sun, we block the sun, they don't produce as much pigment, we have a lighter color skin. No matter who you are, this is going to work for you. So even people with very dark skin can get a tan. They're going to get a little darker based upon the amount of solar exposure and how that environment influences the expression of those traits causes the expression to change. Again, that's the phenotypic plasticity idea. And the last thing to mention here before we get into the problems and how to work the problems and go through genetic problems is this thing called epistasis. Now, epistasis is when one gene can interfere with the expression of another. So you actually have a gene that can block or change the expression of another gene. It goes in there and kind of pushes it out of the way, overrides it, overshadows it, blocks it. So the great example is looking at color in laboratory retrievers. Generally we say brown lab, yellow lab, chocolate lab. They're all Labradors. They're all the same breed of dog. The difference is in the color of their fur. And that difference is dictated by which genes they inherit and which genes are turned on and turned off based upon the expression of the first gene. So dark fur is a dominant trait, dominant variation. Big E produces dark fur. So big E doesn't matter the second E. It could be a big E or a little E. That's going to give you dark color. Now the difference between black and chocolate or we can call it brown, is the second gene. If you have a dominant big B here, and the second B doesn't make a difference, that's going to be a dark pigment that shows up as black. But if your dog inherits recessive Bs, two of them, you have a dark pigment because of the E, but you have a brown fur color because of the two little Bs. Now if you inherit two recessive alleles, that blocks any pigment production, and that's what leads to our yellow labs. 
The second gene cannot change the coat color, it just influences the color of other parts of the lab's body.